pretty excited to be with you. I'm also a little bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> it's the first time that I hold a lecture in English, so my mother tongue is German. I'm from Switzerland. I suppose, or I heard, a lot of you have also other mother tongues. Who, who has another mother tongue thing in English? Yeah, quite a lot. Good, cool. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Good, OK. I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, who I am, just that you have an idea who is standing in front of you. My name is Susan. Uh, my main profession is executive coach. So this means I'm coaching executive members of uh, boards. I coach CEOs. I coach visionaries, people who have a vision and, to wo and who want to manifest this vision and to build a business. From my uh, background, I'm also the founder of Inspiration Unlimited. Inspiration Unlimited is a team that actually made something very new. I originally come from strategy consulting, so I did a lot of strategy consulting in a rational way, logical way, where we analyzed a lot of facts. And Inspiration Unlimited is a team of very intuitional people. So they actually did company analysis by intuition, which means that we felt into different um, business cases into different departments. Where <coughs> is it flowing? Where is it not flowing? What are the blockages? And through that we did a business analysis, which came to the source much clearer and much faster of what are the problems in this company than the intellectual analysis. We did this intuitional analysis in about 40 companies and it was absolutely mind-blowing what happened there because um, one time we came there into a company, the CEO invited us, we had the whole management there, and we started to focus and to concentrate. We did this that the four of us just sat together and we closed our eyes by getting the intuition down and we spoke immediately. So all the information that we got by intuition, we immediately said to the management. So they were sometimes completely astonished. How can you have so much information just by sitting there and listening deeper and listening to your intuition? From my background, I have studied business and international relations. Um, then I grew up in international real HR. I worked at Holcim, a cement company you might know, and I uh, implemented HR strategies in Eastern Europe, so for example in Russia and so on. Then I was a personal assistant to a CEO and then a strategy consultant, as I said before. So just that you have an idea. I did also something that is very unusual for such a career. Uh, I dived for a long time into India and into meditation and yoga. And I found this very inspiring because at one point I felt that strategy consulting is not enough to really make a difference on this earth. So I dived into inner science, like um, how does meditation change our consciousness, our mind. And so today I'm on a crossing of these two paths, of the, the yoga meditation path and the strategy consulting path. So I was very interested, how can we, through meditation, also open our consciousness, our mind, to have, for example, ideas or new ideas for businesses? How can we have innovations? How can we receive ins inspiration? And what I also did and what might be also interesting for you is uh, at the moment I'm interviewing CEOs all over the world who are very innovative. So they receive a lot of inspiration and they manifest this inspiration in no time in new products. So I was fascinated, how do they do that? How do they actually get this inspiration? How do they get a mindset inside themselves where a lot of inspiration can enter? because obviously not everybody can do this. And so this was highly inspiring. And I would like to talk a little bit more about this today. Just that you know what you expect today. We will um, go into exercises like these explorations, 
we have three explorations that we are doing that are interactive. And then I will also go a little bit into theory. What is inspiration? Why does it matter? How does inspiration work? Uh, and how do you remove blockages if inspiration doesn't flow? Good. And I would like that this uh, afternoon is quite interactive. Because to be honest, I don't think that I know what inspiration is. And this is the final knowing. It's rather a knowing that is uh, forming itself. So while am I doing these uh, interviews, for example, I learn with each interview. And I learn with each group that I interact. So I would love also to learn from you how you experience inspiration. What kind of experiences you had with it. And what kind of mind structures you had in this moment when you received inspiration. So it's rather that we learn together about the principles that are behind inspiration instead of me just telling you. So, in the beginning, I would just like to start with levels of listening. It's one tool that I think is very important to receive inspiration. And it's based on Otto Scharmer of Theory U. I think you all already know it. But I think you didn't dive into levels of listening yet. So you know the U already. Now, what does it mean, the Theory U, for listening? So the listening one is downloading. So for example, if you're in a conversation and the other person talks to you, your mind just takes the words and the sentences and puts it into boxes, boxes that you have already from your conditioning out of the past. So this can be how you are raised or your political background. You just put all what you hear, hear into these boxes. So it's a listening from habits and you have a lot of judgments in it. The second one is uh, a level of listening where you listen to facts. So this means you have some facts and figures that you already know, for example by this education that you receive at the moment, and you get some new information and facts. So your brain is actually looking, okay, which kind of facts I have already and are the same, which facts are different than what I have already, and which facts do I already know. So your brain is constantly updating on what kind of facts do I get that are new, or that might even uh, oppose the ideas that I already have, or oppose the facts that I already have. So on this level, when you listen on this level, you have discussions. You can discuss ideas on a rational, intellectual level and say, OK, guy, I have this fact, but you say this is right, so let's discuss that. And then we see who is winning by rational arguments. On listening one, you don't have a discussion. You only have pleasing. Because for you, it is clear that these are the facts what you have learned in your life. And there is nothing else that is the truth. Your truth is the only one. So you have this, for example, also if you look in religion, um, the, those guys who are really strongly believing in their religion and this religion is the only one and this God is the only right one, then this would be the listening number one or discussing from number one. The listening number two you have a lot in science or at universities, also in companies. The listening number three is not so well known. It's an empathic listening from within. So very often this is described to listen with your heart. So this means while you listen to somebody, you also receive an information of the person that you are listening on an emotional level. So uh, let's just, for example, take Stefan. If you look at him huh, and you listen to him, so you also get not only his words that he's saying, or you not only get what you see from him, but you also see in which kind of emotional state he is at the moment. Is he relaxed? Is he stressed? I just take you as an example, excuse me, <laughs> for this. 
So you receive an information also from which place is this person talking. So maybe sometimes you're criticized by somebody. And somebody says, OK, I don't like what you do. And then you can listen deeply from what place does this person speak. Does this person really have an issue or something that you can learn? so that you can, can become better, that you can improve yourself? Or is this criticism, for example, out of jealousy? Maybe this person is jealous about you and what you do and what you get in your life. So when this person talks to you from a place of jealousy or even from anger, then you don't have to take it so seriously as if it's coming from a neutral place. It, does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's very interesting to see from which place people are talking to you, especially if you're criticized. And uh, as you will be managers or that you will work in companies, um, the more successful you get, you also will have criticism. You will have criticism from media, for example. You will have criticism from employees who don't like you. So it's very interesting to dive a little bit deeper and see, for example, if your employees are criticizing you, why are they doing this? Is it because you really have made a mistake? Or is it because they are afraid of all the changes that happen at the moment? Are they afraid to lose their job? Because how you react to them makes a lot of difference. Are you reacting on the facts and figures that they're saying, OK, you're an asshole? Or are you actually feeling that, they are, that there is this fear of these changes and the fear that they will lose their jobs? Because then, we'll t then you will talk completely different with them. Because you will address while talking their fear and not their words or their criticism. So this makes much more sense. It's a much more healing way of discussion. Then we have the listening number four. Uh, you know, with Otto Sharma, this is the presencing state. And it's a generative listening from the source or from the future. So what does that mean? A generative listening means that you generate something only by listening. I don't know if you've experienced it, but I would like to give you an example. When I do these interviews with these innovative CEOs, I listen on a very, very, very deep place inside of me. And through this, the other person has a lot of space to talk. And there is a lot of silent moments. And very often, they say something they have never said before. So actually, when I ask them, how do you receive your inspiration? What kind of states are you in when you receive inspiration? They have to think. And then you can, by listening, you can open like a room. And then it is as if the information that is implicitly in the CEO can crystallize itself into words. So in management, you have a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of talks, of course, that you have. But also, very often, um, you, you make questionnaires, you know, you ask people in the company or you ask clients, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? So when you do this uh, dialogue, so when you do these questionnaires, you can listen from a much deeper place where you get much more information than if you only listen on the levels one to three. And of course, this means that you listen from a state where you are kind of empty inside of yourself. So this means you're not occupied in yourself with your stories. Do you know what I mean by being occupied with your stories inside? Yeah, you know that. OK, cool. OK, so this is the, the listening to his open mind, open heart, and then open will. So let me see if I go into that now. No, uh, let's do it now like this. I would like that three of you, three or four of you, you take one paper. 
and you write on this paper, you do the different levels of listening that we just had. You do like this. And you have here listening one, downloading, listening two, factual, listening three, empathic, listening four, generative. And then each one of you, so always three or four together, you make a point, how did you listen now the last five minutes? So for example, Susan listened at factual listening and you do, this is my first listening, Susan. Please go ahead. inspiration and I would love to hear from you some words on that what what in your in your experience what is inspiration how would you describe that please go ahead have a new ideas have a new ideas yeah yeah that's like a heightened level of motivation how much you like as an individual can really connect to whatever goals you're going for heightened motivation I love like that thank you the power of doing something you want to do, but that you, you don't know the way. Maybe. Okay, you don't know the way, but you have the power, you feel the power and energy inside you. I like that, thank you. What is inspiration? So it seems to be kind of a connection between a new idea, a thought, and a kind of energy, like power or motivation. You feel something buzzing inside yourself. So last week I was talking to a business developer. Do you know what business developers do? Yeah? Business developers, they have to look for new business ideas. They have to look for different business fields where they can use the technology that the company already has. So de they develop new markets, basically. And I asked him, so Ian, how, how do you know when you have a market or a new client that this is it? This is where you have to go. And then he studied and he said, I don't know. And I said, but you must know somehow. And I said, oh yeah, I know it. It's tingling in my skin. It's tingling in my skin. And then I know it, that's it. So I go for this, I go for this market. Because of course you have a lot of markets that you could go into. And that's also very interesting because today we actually evaluate new markets by rational facts. Hmm? So we have markets, then we think, okay, what are the positive, effe positive effects if we go in this market? What are the negative effects? But what this business developer does, he is scanning through it, you know, just through his awareness, like, okay, this market, this market, this market, and here he feels the tingling in his skin. So that's a completely new sensor and measurement, how we can feel where inspiration, meaning an idea, thought, and an energy is actually flowing to. So businesses that go with this intuition or this inspiration, they're very often much quicker than businesses who go with the old way of rationally evaluate all the markets. So when you look at California, in California we have a lot of businesses that have a lot of inspiration that change the way how we live today. I mean, you all know it, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all these kind of new medias. So how was it possible that they could so quickly develop these new products? And I, I can guarantee you, none of them did a market study like in a rational way. They just felt it, that's it. Here's the energy going along. And this is what I would like to give you a little bit of insight and a feeling and an experience today. How can you develop that tingling or this sensor or this measurement for what is the right thing for you? Please. Uh, you were speaking about like uh, you know, the rational, like or an emotional way of, of, of see the things like a uh, business or something. But my point of view is very complicated to develop that uh, that 
without a, a rational sense. I don't know if I explain myself. You think it's difficult without a rational sense? I think that it's really difficult to develop your emotional, uh, your emotional, uh, your emotional mind. Uh huh. And and I think that if, if we don't see the things in a rational way, yes. There are a few people that just can do that because it's a very, it's, it's a very uh, special uh, knowledge or quality. Yeah. As a, you know what the Otto Sharma actually is supposing? It's that you have the freedom to choose between different methods. So it's a freedom if you can actually work in a rational, logical way. But you can, if you want, also have the deeper listenings that we had. If you can listen, for example, with your body, if you can feel this tingle and listen to it. So it's just a bigger range of options that you have. So what I say is, also in my job as executive coach, I need the rational path a lot. I need an intellectual path a lot, because all my customers are actually very intellectual types. They did, and I have to understand this, and I have to meet them on an intellectual level. It's very important. So I say in no way that you should discard intellectual and rational ways of uh, going ahead about your business or your strategy. I think it's very useful. But I think also that we have other ways that open up the range of possibilities how you can act. And I think it's a success factor for the future, to be honest. OK. Does it answer your question? Yes. Yeah, cool. OK. So I was looking up what does inspiration mean. And uh, the definitions I found creative, surprising impulses. So surprising seems to be a very important word. So very often, if we are in an inspiring discussion, there are sur some surprising thoughts coming down. It's not only the thoughts that we always have th thought before, but it's surprising. Then we have sudden insights. We have information that is new and creates a resonance with the current situation. We have information from the future that was not there before. And you know the book of Otto Sharma is called Leading from the Future. So kind of you need ideas or visions that come from the future. And um, recently I also talked to a member of a very big company we have in Switzerland. It's called Swisscom. It's a technology company in uh, the phone business. And I asked him, what is your biggest challenge with your team? And he said, the biggest challenge with my team is that I have a vision from the future how, what kind of technologies will be there, how our life is technologically structured, and my team is still in the past. So my team is conditioned from the past in their thinking. So it's very difficult to bring them to the level to believe in my vision of the future. So actually, they always think uh, on their experience based. So their actions are coming from the past. Instead, if your vision is more real than what is actually here. So for a lot of these inspiring CEOs that I have met, their vision of the future is more real than today's life. So today, for example, we are all sitting here in this room with these tables. And for most of the people, this is the most real thing you can have. But for those guys, their vision of the future is more real than what we see here around. So this means they live, act, and manage their company as if the future would already exist. So sometimes you even think they are acting or they're playing a film. Because they act as if this new technology would already exist. And all kind of people tell them, hey, you're crazy, man. This will never happen. So I met a couple, just this example. I met a couple in Los Angeles. And at the moment, they have a company where they develop a motor for airplanes. And this motor should bring you from Paris to New York in four hours. 
yeah, you see? This is the reaction that they very often get. A smile, it's impossible. You can forget it. And this motor also should be at no sound. So it's a very crazy thing. But I can guarantee you, if somebody is developing this motor, it will be them. Because they have invested, I come in a moment, just a moment, um, they have invested millions in that. They have this vision that this is possible. And through this vision, they attracted a lot of engineers who are very inspired by this mission because they want to do something that they have never done before and they want to work in an environment where it's inspiring. So I see this also with these inspiring companies, they never have a recruitment problem because they recruit people easily. Because the best people of their field, they always want to work in an inspirational environment, in an inspiring environment. Please go ahead. No, I wanted to ask if it was the, the vacuum uh, train. No, it's not. No. no. It's the vacuum train, I don't know about it. No, they, they, they developed this idea of a vacuum train that goes through a vacuum tube uh -huh. that is propelled just by magnets, and there's no friction. That was in the 1960s already. Yeah. OK. But didn't get developed. Okay, I see. Okay. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. Great. So yesterday morning I actually received this statement and I really liked it and I thought I'd bring it to you today. You've got a new story to write and it looks nothing like your past. And I actually think this is the task for you guys. Because the past, somehow, I don't know if we can manage this world as we did in the past. We have a lot of challenges. I will talk about it later. And I, I'm not sure if we can go on like this. I think we have to invent ourselves new. We have to invent the way how we want to live, what kind of technologies we want to use, how we want to deal with nature. OK, now I would like to uh, make a little exercise with you. Please think for a moment about a moment in your life when you have felt very inspired. It can be a discussion that you had. It can be a book that you've read. It can be a music that you heard. Just think for a moment, when have you been really inspired in your life? What kind of situation has this been? Were you alone or were you with others? And in what kind of mindset have you been? Was it a very open mindset or did you feel very closed? And how did you feel? What kind of emotions did you have in this moment? Did you feel stressed? Or did you feel in a flow? Okay. And now I would like to go three of you together. And each person is actually sharing from this moment of inspiration that you had. And the other two are only listening. You have about four minutes to talk. And don't interrupt the person who talks. But while this person talks, listen on all four levels. Listen as deep as you can and try to find out the principles behind inspiration. Find out how does it work? How do people actually receive inspiration? What makes the difference? So each, each person has four minutes to talk and the others listen deeply. And I will, after four minutes, I will tell you, then we can change. And at the end, you can discuss your findings. Are there any questions about that? OK, please format yourself in, in pairs of three.
groups of three. Okay, please come become quiet for a moment. <laughs> and now just reflect those of you who were listening. On which level did you listen? And write it down on your paper. Like for example, S2. Okay, now one more question. It was pretty long time, and I'm sure that the person who actually told you something ended much before the time has finished, isn't it? Okay. So how, what did you do in this moment that the person was finished? Ask questions. Ask questions. What else? Started to think about something else? So I give you an advice. Also for your future businesses, if you want to get more information out than what is on the first side here, don't say anything. Say, uh, stay listening. Because if you stay in a listening position or attitude, the other person will actually add some information very often. And this information, for example, if you have a client, I have, for example, sometimes I have clients and they're not my clients yet. So I really have to understand what are their challenges to tell them that me as a coach, I can help them. And if the person says something and immediately I say something against it, I never get this deeper information. So try in the next round, if you can bear it, bear it, if you can bear it, to stay with the silence. And it's not so easy for us. It makes us nervous to stay with this silence and not to say anything. So just observe this nervousness in you, that's okay. But just try it out if you can do it, it's not so easy. Okay, second round, second person. Go ahead. We have break time till five o'clock. We see you at five again. So now, very interesting. You had a break. Everybody was talking. Where did you listen from? What happened? Just write it down on your paper. Okay, I would like to give you a little story of a man that I also uh, met in California. He has a very innovative technology company as well, and he found some really special solutions also for technolo technological problems. And I asked him, how, how did you find these solutions? How did you get this inspiration? And he said, you know, I have a very funny story for you. Each morning, I read um, a future novel. How would you call this a future novel? Sci like, hmm? Sci-fi novel? No, um, you know novels that um, 
that come that that are in the future, playing in the flu future. How do you call this in English? I don't know. Science fiction, exactly. Science fiction novel. So he's actually <laughs> he's actually a guy who can read. Uh, cross uh, cross reading so he reads very fast so every morning he has one hour in the bus and he reads in this hour one science fiction novel each morning and through this science fiction novel he gets so inspired that he finds through this what happens in this novel a technological solution so how does this happen so what this man actually does, he is listening on a very deep way to this novel while reading it. So it's not a listening through the ears, but it's an inner attitude. He listens so deeply to this creativity, and then he has the ability to take this creativity and to transform it into another business case. So very often you see this in these innovative people, that they have some hobbies that have nothing to do with their actual, actual profession, have nothing to do with their business case. And very often they're inspired by this hobby or this special interest, as for example science fiction, and they find their solutions there, or they get inspired there for their business cases. All right, now, we not only have levels of listening, but we have also levels of talking. So this means when we talk to each other, we can talk from different levels. So what does mean talking from level one? What do you think? How would level one talking look like? The routine um, small talk maybe? Routine small talk, right? What else? Yeah, it happens to routine when you also say something and you don't really care of what uh, the other person is gonna say after. So let's say I say something about religion, I'm really convinced I'm not, I don't care what the other person is gonna say. Exactly, I don't care what others think or say. What else? Do you know these people who just talk and talk and talk and they're unstoppable? <laughs> yes? And you can see that their surrounding, they're already gone inside. They do like this, they take their handy and you know, look on their phone. They're completely gone. Their body is still there, but inside they have gone. But the person who is talking is still talking on them and doesn't realize that the others have left inside. It's only the body that stands there. So that would be, for example, a talking from number one. The person doesn't get anything, it's just pouring out whatever comes to his or her mind, or whatever she or he thinks. So what is listening, uh, talking to? How would that look like? Do you remember a moment when you were talking on two? Yes, please. Maybe you want to talk about something and then I ask what you think. Uh-huh. And then okay. I'm interested in what the other person is saying. Yeah. And then I listen, like actually listen. Yeah, exactly. So you exchange ideas, huh? Yeah. What else? What are characteristics of talking on level two? So one more thing that is very important is you try to convince. So you have a point of view and you try to convince the other. And if the other is not able to convince you, you will convince them. So it's kind of a game, a very competitive game in talking. So just as an example, I had this very often with my father, actually. So when we had political issues, we were talking, da 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 da, and it goes very quickly and very intellectually. So the whole other family couldn't follow. It was just my father and me, and da 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 da, but no, 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 no. Huh? So this is the energy that we have on factual talking. And then you see at the end of the evening who wins. 
is usually the person who has the last statement. <laughs> you know that? Yeah, good. Okay, what does mean talking from number three? How do you imagine that? Yes, please. I think everyone has that like friend who gets a little too drunk and it says, says way too much like, serious, like I love you, man. Like, you know, everyone has that friend who's just like talking from within a little too much. Ah, wow. Which just means, Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's honest thoughts. Honest thoughts from within. In vino veritas, huh? Mm -hmm. in, in the wine is the truth, yes. and the emotional <laughs> truth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's a very special example. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other examples without alcohol? Generally, when you share your feelings um, that are more personal than factual based? Yes, exactly. You share your feelings. Yes. I was just going to say. It's kind of a point in conversation when you begin engaging with someone's heart rather than just like a mind to mind yep. kind of thing, but you can really, it's almost tangible where you can kind of like, okay, now we're like really talking or like sticking our teeth into the, wow. you know, the substance of the conversation. Have you ever had such a discussion? Mm -hmm. how, how, describe a little bit more this heart to heart connection. How did you feel it that this happens? You said it's tangible. Yeah, um, I mean, typically it's it's with people you've known for a while, mm -hmm. but sometimes I've found that like if you just have a very long conversation with someone, it's almost like a step by step down the listening process. You know, mm -hmm. you know how, how was your day, whatever, and you know, small talk, and then it kind of goes to factual recalling parts of their day, and then it kind of really gets into okay, like where is your heart? Mm. What are you feeling right now? Like, where is your being? You know. Mm. So you actually describe that usually when you meet an old friend, a good friend, you start here, you go through that, and finally you land here. Do others know this experience? Yeah. Okay. So very often I have the feeling when we when we arrive here, or when I arrive here with a friend. Now it really matters. Now I'm not bored at all. Because it's really about life. What are your sorrows? What is your love about? What are you passionate about? What is it really about it? And it's an energy also, as you said, it's, it's an energy. You can feel it in the air. It's a completely different space that you're talking in. Very nice example, thank you. Uh, sir, did you want to uh, add something? Uh, maybe constructive criticism, because when you give a constructive criticism, you, you're doing it because you care about the other person and you want to give them suggestions of what you think. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking, you don't want to be too critical, too aggressive, so you look at uh, the, the movements of the other person. So if you say something and you see an expression, you try to, to, to solve it with saying something else or adding a compliment. Mm -hmm. So you have to be you're really careful of what the other person is feeling when you're talking. Mm. Very interesting example. I actually would like to take this up because this is very interesting. Um, because in companies you have also feedback culture, or you don't have a feedback culture. And so how do you give feedback to somebody? How do you give, for example, feedback to your boss? or how do you criticize? It's also connected to criticism. So there is one possibility. You criticize from a point or from an inner motivation to change the other person. So the other person has to change in order that you feel better. It can also happen with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Huh? Please don't let your stinky socks lying here in the bathroom. I hate that. So this comes from a motivation of wanting to change the other. But then there is also some criticism or feedback that you can give out of your heart because you want the other person to grow. You want to help the other person. And then you can speak out of your heart, hey man, 
For example, you have such a big potential, I can see this in you, and I really would like that you are successful in your life. And maybe if you adjust this a little bit, or if you dress a little bit else, I think you would have more success. If you do a job interview, and you don't go with this sloppy jumper, but you rather take, take something you know, that is closer how the people dress where you have the interview. And if you give this feedback from your heart, it resonates completely different. It lands very often very different. Because if the person realizes that you talk from a space where you want to change them, what they usually do? They get angry. They get angry? Not listening. Not listening, shutting down. Huh? So basically they do like this. Maybe not physically, but energetically they say, no, I'm not interested. Huh? Okay, so this was talking from number three. How about talking from number four? How do you imagine that? Did you have an experience when somebody was talking from number four? Okay, all right. It's very hard to imagine, isn't it? So also, I see it very, very seldom in our world. Sometimes I see it, you have very inspiring leaders. Could be in business. It could be also, for example, a Dalai Lama. You know, the Dalai Lama, if you have seen him, he just sits there, tons of people around him, and he just sits there silently for a moment and looks at the people, and then suddenly, he starts to talk and it resonates in thousands of people. So I would call this a talking from the four. That it's coming, it's coming from almost nowhere. It's coming from the silence. And you have to wait until it comes. You have to wait until the words appear in you. It's not that you think something and then you say it. It's rather that you listen inside and the words appear and flow out. It's also these moments when you are surprised about what you say. Maybe some of you have experienced this, that some, for example, a colleague of you is looking for an advice from you and suddenly you say something absolutely genius or intelligent and you think, oh, wow, this was cool, what I just said. So this is usually coming from this fourth place. It's not even known to you. It's surprising to yourself what you say. So I love these moments, to be honest. I love it. Good. Are any questions to talking on these four levels? Good. Before you had this exercise, the three of you, where you shared your experiences. And now I would like you, the three of you, to have a conversation together about what principles can you see in inspiration? What principle can you see in this moment where inspiration happens? And have a look from which place you're talking. Are you just now thinking, duh, 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 duh. okay, that's it, point one, two, three? Or how can you really listen inside yourself? What did I explore before when I was listening to my colleagues? And let it happen, let the words happen. Just try, it's a game. You can't lose anything. So the three of you, you have now five minutes to discuss what kind of principles have you found out through these different stories that you heard before? Questions? Okay, go ahead. the group there on the back. 
Because you looked really very, that you go very deep when I looked at you. Actually, I'm, I'm, uh, it's something, because we're Chinese, so we, we usually think inside the box. So actually, what we got inspired is normally, um, what you said is from the business leaders or teachers. So it's actually something like um, when they tell you something that you have never imagined. For example, when I'm in Hong Kong, I, am, I was quite inspired about traveling uh, by professional reservations and in Discovery Channel about how the method that how you can travel around them. So it's like when they, for us, we think the principle is as something that is really new to you, different culture of your of, of what you have learned in okay. your young. So um, that's what we think is quite an essential principle. Is it what you say is that you, if you go to another culture, you get inspired by the new culture? Yes. Okay. Very interesting. Yes. Because um, just like him, he's from Spain. So um, at, in Hong Kong, when uh, I was quite um, uh, inspired by my teachers, he told me that there's a very extremely um, good festival in Spain called Las Flores. It's like fire festival that they, they build monuments and they Burn it to send it to God. So um, it's quite interesting that you can never see that kind of um, uh, monuments in Hong Kong, in, in China that built for the religion. So it's quite, quite interesting for me and it's quite inspiring. Wow, very good. Yeah. So I would like to connect to that one because that's an interesting one. Who of you has? done a journey to a completely different culture. Please raise your hand. Okay, most of you, okay. What I observed myself when I went to India, each time I went to India, which is a completely other culture, somehow my senses opened, I got inspired, and suddenly things happened that would have never happened at home. And this is also a principle that I observed in the CEOs. Because if, if there is inspiration, this also usually means that they have awareness that is much wider than uh, normal people have. And in this wider awareness, you actually get more information and you meet other people. And so usually this also happens if you go to a trip into another culture. Because in this other culture, nothing is familiar to you. You might be even at danger because you don't know the culture. You don't know where to go. You don't know where to find your hotel. So your awareness is automatically raised and more open. And this is the moment where some inspiration can fall in. Can you connect to what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is now, how can we do this in our daily life? I mean, we cannot always go to another culture. But how can we raise our awareness, our presence in our daily life to get this inspiration? Very interesting. OK, other principles that you have found out. Let's maybe hear two more. One thing we kind of collectively found was that it almost requires a stillness or a calm that is interior rather than exterior. Mm. So for her, it was being on a run, mm. but for another member, it was while reading. Mm. And for me, very often, it's before a piano or something like that. So it's a calm that's interior, not necessarily like a physical calm, so not just sitting down, mm. but like a stillness that kind of stops the hurrying and the racing of living in London. And of your mind. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Very good. It actually reminds me about something funny that happened to me. Uh, this business developer that I already talked to you, I said, okay, so when are the moments that you're getting inspired? And he said, well, you know, I usually get inspired when I'm under the shower. And then he said to me, 
Susan, you actually could take your look clients under the shower. That would be the most easiest. <laughs> 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 because under the shower, you are very relaxed. Huh? And then, yeah, somehow you don't think about your daily business. Water is coming, streaming, and automatically you're kind of relaxing into it. And then very often happens that ideas come. Very nice example. It can also by reading, chalking. A lot of CEOs also chalk and then they have their ideas. Very nice example. Especially in chalking, you know, you have also this flow experience when you completely get in another state of mind where these things also happen. Okay, one last one, one last principle. Maybe the ladies over there? Yeah, I was gonna say, ours is really different than everyone else's. We both said, when we shared our stories, ours both came from a place of listening to some speak and I just said that when I hear people like that's in the industry or something like that talk about their journey um, and how they got to where they were and that they started in a place where I currently am, it makes me think that like, oh, I can be, I can be inspired, I can do things like mm -hmm. they did. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. Just by listening to them and getting the energy, huh? Mm -hmm. The energy, the drive, the motivation that they have. And how did they do it? Yeah, very inspiring. Thank you. Okay, I would like to share with you, um, where do I have this now, just a second. How does inspiration work? Just to give you an idea, it's not the finished truth forever, but just to give you an idea, I saw horizontal inspiration. With horizontal inspiration, I mean inspiration that is provoked by existing things. So just as the lady shared with us now, an existing thing is, for example, a CEO or, you know, Steve Jobs, for example, he was very inspiring to us. It can be a book, a music, it can be nature. Very much people are uh, very often inspired by nature. Then I see vertical inspiration. The vertical inspiration seems not to come from what already exists, but seems to come really from a future that we don't know yet. So for example, when Einstein found his formula, he said something like it just dropped in. It was nothing that ever, ever anybody thought before or that anybody experienced before. Or for example, now this, uh, this motor for airplanes. You know, nobody has done this before. You don't have a role model yet. It's just something new that chuck, happens. Or Facebook. We haven't seen anything like Facebook before. And then chuck, it happens. So this is what I call a vertical inspiration. Sudden insights, sudden ideas, sudden solutions. Surprising yourself in speak and action. And then I see what this lady over here shared is an interactional inspiration. So this means through interaction with other people, you have a very inspiring conversation or you have a very inspiring teamwork. And this inspiring teamwork, it usually happens if the whole potential of each member comes fully in and is fully participating. So this is the opposite of this moment that I shared with you before when one person is just shedding out everything that she thinks or he thinks and is just talking and the others are gone. So if you have a meeting or even if you are at a party, shall we say at the dinner, you can observe. Sometimes everybody is sharing, you know, at the moment they share something and it gets very inspiring. Everybody is in it energetically. And sometimes you can see two people are in a very energetical conversation and the others are gone inside. So it's very interesting to see these dynamics. When does it get very inspiring if you're in a group or in a team? Because this is what you want to have in business also. You want to have inspiring discussions. You want to have inspiring business meetings. You don't want to have all these boring business meetings where everybody thinks, oh God, still one hour to go. How, how will I survive? And it very often happens in today's business still. Does this make sense? Can you apply this or can you understand what I'm talking about? More or less? Okay, cool. 
So what time do we have? Okay, we still have some time. So inspiring discussions, inspiring teamwork. Uh, how does inspiration work? I would like to talk a little bit more about this vertical inspiration that we were talking. What I explored is that, for example, if you have a child, and the child sees, for example, a candle, it is very curious to go to this candle and explore it. So this means an impulse is coming in. He actually sees the candle here. Hmm? Whoops. And he, he actually gets the impulse to act upon this, what he sees, and to explore this candle, and then to explore the fire. Now what happens very often is that the parent, or one of the parents, for example, the mom comes and say, no, don't go to this candle, it's absolutely dangerous, don't do this. And the child says, oh, okay, I don't do this. So the impulse that actually comes into this child is stopped. It is not allowed to act upon this impulse. Now, this happens during our education all the time. I give you an example. My nephew just came to me, he's six years, he's not in school yet. And he came to me and says, Susan, I am writing a book. I am writing a book. And then I looked at him and his mother came along and said, no, Jason, you're lying. You cannot even write. You cannot even read. But the interesting thing is that this little gentleman, he actually had this vision of him writing a book. It was his desire to write a book. But he, so this means an impulse is coming down of writing a book, whether I can do it or not, doesn't really matter. And my mom says, no, stop, stop. Don't have these ideas, you are, you are, you are lying. It's not the truth what you are saying. But by this, you basically stop the child from going with, her, with his or her impulses, with his or her inspiration. So what we heard, I think it was a gentleman in the front here, before he said, I go with the things I love and then inspiration comes. And this is a crucial law of inspiration. If you go for the things you love or you are attracted, may it be a candle, may it be some music, some inspiration can drop in. But if you stop this natural cycle of an inspiration or an impulse coming in and you are acting upon it, if you stop this, this impulse actually will turn here. And it will kind of block you here. So very often if I ask adults, what do you want? What are you passionate about? What is your vision? They don't know. They don't have a clue. And you can do this in your surrounding. If you ask your friends, your parents, what is your vision? What do you want? What are you passionate about? What is inspiring for you? They don't know. And very often this has to do that in the education and in their childhood, it has just been blocked. So now, if the impulses are blocked inside of you, and you can't do what you want, so you can also not receive the inspiration. So you don't receive the impulses. So how to unblock that? This is now the question for us, how to unblock that. And to unblock this, you follow again just your impulses that you get, you follow your desires, you follow the things you love, and you follow the things where you feel excited. You know this tingling when you're excited in your body? Follow that, because this is your measurement. If you go to the places and to the people where you come back more energized than you went in. That's it. If you go to people, you meet them and afterwards you're completely exhausted just by having met them, you missed something. You definitely missed something. 
So I encourage you, really go with this energy. Where is your energy level rising? Where can you feel this excitement in your body? Where can you feel joy? One CEO actually from Switzerland, a very innovative guy also, he said, you know, for me the measurement is joy. If I feel joy, I go for it. If I don't feel joy, I don't go for it. Even if rationally it's a good business case, if I don't, I'm not interested, it doesn't inspire me, I don't go for it. It's just boring for me. And he's very successful too. But joy is his measurement. So joy seems to open it again. Now, one more thing. Sometimes the impulses that come in are kind of crazy. People get impulses that nobody else understands. Why you're doing this? Why are you dressing like this? Why are you so crazy and you go to the UK and study here? For example, those who come from abroad. Why don't you stay comfortably at home? So this is also something. We are conditioned to do what others like and what others understand, especially our peers. So usually we want to belong to our peers. We want to be loved by our peers. And we don't act upon the impulses that come to us because we want to be loved. So let's say, for example, one morning you wake up and you get the impulse, oh, I would love to wear a, ra a red hat today. Would you do it? Would you wear a red hat? Completely crazy? You would. Yeah. Okay, good. Almost. Why not? <laughs> good. A lot of people wouldn't. It's because of fear. Fear what other people think. Fear that they don't love you. Fear, you know, anything that you don't succeed. So, I would like to show you the blockages that we have for, uh, for, the, for inspiration. So we have again this U, and we have three blockages that Otto Sharma found out. The first blockage is judgment. So we see something and immediately we judge. And through judgment it goes in our box. The second one, the second blockage that he actually identified is cynicism. So we are cynically. So I see this very often um, concerning intuition. I told you in the beginning that we did this an intuitional mm -hmm. analysis. And um, I have dealt very often in this management with one or two person who were a little bit cynical. They couldn't believe that this is really something, you know that this is really useful intuition. I mean, come on, it's just something in your stomach or something like this. But intuition is this really something that supports our business case. So they were kind of cynical. And th through this cynicism, they couldn't really listen deeply to what is actually the gift. The next blockage is fear. So I see this a lot in companies that there are some young people joining the company who are, have a lot of inspiration, who bring new ideas. And the old staff very often is afraid of these new ideas. So probably this will happen to a lot of you actually when you join a company. So you have the old ones and they want to just go their own way, how they always did it. And you, of course, you're fresh, you're coming from fresh university, you come with fresh ideas. And so you meet this fear of them that something is changing and they are not able to do their work anymore as they did. Maybe they are not even needed anymore. So this is the biggest fear, that they are not needed or that they are not good enough, that they don't have the new knowledge that you will bring to them. So they are afraid of losing their face also. So this fear actually stops inspiration. 
And this fear can stop your own inspiration, but with your fear or the fear of others, you can also stop others. You can stop other inspiring people. So what is very, very important is that you, at least in yourself, have a knowledge about the feelings that you have inside you. That you know when some fear is coming up and that you know when you're not acting upon an impulse because of fear. I would like to do a little exercise on that with you. Have a look in your life when you have maybe a crazy idea or you know it's just something fancy that you would like to do. So for example, in my case it was something, I always went out with friends but I never went out on my own. And then I was in another city, and I felt like, oh God, I would love to dance tonight. Huh? But I'm a woman, alone, in another city. I don't know anybody. Now, do I act up on this impulse and go dancing on my own, a woman, completely alone in a different city? Or do I sit at my hotel and it's boring? because of the fear, what will happen if I go into this new surrounding and expose myself. So in this case, I realized, okay, there's some fear coming in and I'm acting up in fear if I stay at my hotel room. And now that I realize this fear, I have a choice. I can act up on this fear or I can go out and experience something very exciting. So this is my choice now. But if I don't know that I have this fear, you're just acting up on it automatically. So I would like you to share a little bit with each other. When in your life did you have an impulse or a crazy idea or something you really would have loved to do and you didn't do it? Did this happen? Did it not happen? And why did it happen? Were you afraid of something? And of what? Did you want to belong to your peers, to your group? Did you not wear this and this? Or let me take another good example that is a very exciting one. Maybe in your life you had once the impulse to talk to this beautiful guy, this absolutely amazing guy, or this amazing girl for the, wi for the boys. You had an impulse, you saw her and you thought, oh God, I would love, you know, I would love to go out with her. But what do I do? I hide myself as good as possible. And I talk to my friend, my best friend, as, 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 as engaged as possible, so that I don't have to feel this insecurity or this anxiety to talk to this beautiful guy or this, to this beautiful girl. Okay, I think you have enough examples what I'm talking about. I would like you to share what were your crazy things that you did want to do or what was the impulse and what prevented you to do this or what didn't prevent you to do it but you felt it please share the three of you again Please. We kind of talked about, always talked about judgment and fears going hand in hand. I think a lot of people are afraid of being judged, and mm -hmm. like that, the fear stems from judgment. Um, and like Jacob talked about, like uh, fear, uh, like kind of judging yourself harder than uh, other people might be judging you. It's like it's kind of taking your self worth and like, what would other people think of? What would I think of myself? You know, mm -hmm. the situation. 
you know, and I think that's, I think everyone kind of can connect with that. I think that might be kind of a contribution to like the bubbly atmosphere because everyone at some point has encountered one of these blockages or all of them. Mm. Very, very good example. I think exactly this mechanism prevents a lot of good business cases. Because what I see, for example, uh, so at least in Switzerland, we are perfectionist. We want to do everything perfect. And we are afraid to bring something out in the market that is not perfect for being judged, for being criticized. So for this reason, a lot of products don't get to the market. Yeah, very good. Maybe the fear from the un uh, of the unknown? The fear of the unknown, yes. Can you say an example? Um, it could be anything. It could be in business or in personal life. Mm -hmm. For example, in business, if you, um, you want to do something, mm -hmm. but you're not sure of, about the results, so we say, okay, it's better not do that and stick with what we have already. Very good, very good. I think a lot of business casing get, get lost because of that. Because if you have a very inspiring vision, you usually don't know how to get there. You just don't know. But what you do if you have this vision is you listen to your impulses every day. What do I need to do to realize this vision? And step by step, you realize this vision, even if you don't know how to get there. So one very important work that I have to do in technology companies is to calm the management down with not knowing. Because if they don't have a business case with milestones, every milestone is clear how we are getting there, they're getting so nervous. They can't bear this nervousness inside of them. But if you want to have brand new products, if you want to have innovation, you have to go with the unknown. Very good. Some other principles. Good. I think this is the sign. I would like to give you one last thing on your way. If you go home now, or this evening, or tomorrow, please try out to do something crazy. Just do something you have never done before, you have never dared before. And the only reason why you do it, you observe what happens inside of you. If you're afraid, very good, go for it. <laughs> and just try what happens if you're going, even if you feel this fear, or it is maybe being charged. So this will expand your freedom. So thank you very much for listening to me and enjoy this crazy thing that you're going to do. Thank you.